very much. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I hope everybody's having a great Comic Con. I'm having an amazing Comic Con. Um, so I hope you guys have seen a lot of cool thank stuff. Uh, one announcement I want to make about um, some of the Dark Horse digital stuff that we're doing. There's a Spike, there's an exclusive Spike comic, an eight page story by Jane Espenson and George's Genty. Yeah that uh, will be exclusively available online for free if you go into a comic book shop in August and request us a code. If you go into a comic book shop and ask them for this, go to your local comic shop, you can look at uh, Comic Book Locator online and find your local comic shop and they'll give you something totally free to go get this. Sorry? Angel's not in this one. England? Oh. No, we're trying to work out what we can do internationally, but the England, the, the scores that carry our comics in the UK and I believe Australia will have the codes if, if they order them from us. So talk to your store owners and make sure that they're requesting the codes because they can get as many as they want just for asking, okay? Um, so I hope you check that out. I hope you're looking forward to the comics. We're doing uh, a new Dollhouse series. Um, So we have a five-issue Dollhouse series in, in, in uh, July. In August, we're launching Angel and Faith. Yeah. And then in September, we have uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 9, starting with yeah. Buffy yeah. 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 in San Francisco. So without further ado, I want to introduce the creator of Buffy, Serenity, Dollhouse, Dr. Horrible, Angel, so many great characters, and the director of the Avengers, Joss Whedon. Yeah. Where did the good noise go? <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I'm shameless. Some of you already know this. Um, and my need for approbation is limitless. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you guys for, uh, for everything, as always. Um, as usual, I have very little to say that Scott hasn't already said about uh, the fact that we're bringing out um, the new books, Angel and Faith. Uh, who are a wacky team. Um, they're cops. They don't get along, but then they learn from each other. That's going to be exciting. A uh, different kind of a thing. And then, of course, Buffy Season 9. Um, uh, which, uh, some of you may know, I started writing at the end of Buffy Season 8 um, because uh, I was so excited to get Buffy back to the Buffy uh, from the show, the Buffy who's living a life that we can all relate to. I know that many of you have been generals in uh, mystical wars and had sex that created universes, but um, I think we could maybe get to a, a more universal stuff than that, and that's what we're trying to do with Buffy Season 9. I'm really excited about it and grateful, as always, to Scott and Sierra and all the people at Dark Horse who keep this stuff going, the Serenity comics, the Dollhouse comics. Um, the, comics based on uh, a laundry list uh, I made recently. Um, no, they, uh, they, um, these universes are, are not throwaways. They're stuff that we care about so much. And uh, the fact that we get to continue them at a place where we know we're going to get extraordinary artists, great editors, and enormous support uh, is just terrific. So that's pretty exciting. That's pretty much all that's going on with me. Um, what's up with you guys? What's, uh, what's going on with you guys? What are you up to? Firefly Hurts? Firefly Addiction! Oh, yes, fire, fire, Firefly Addiction. Um, you know, there are groups uh, that can help you with that. Um, you, know, what they'll, you know, they'll get you on Babylon 5 for a while till you <laughs> level out, and then, um, you know, and then eventually you, know, you can rejoin society. But um, um, I, uh, I believe that there are microphones set up, and I think the best way for us to handle this little session is for you guys to ask me what you want to know about, and for me to tell you that I'm not allowed to tell you. So let's, uh, 
Let's get that process started. Uh, I see people lining up. Um, is there more than one mic? Oh, wow. You're all here. The lights are very bright. The lights are very bright. And sometimes I think that you are my imaginary friends. Sometimes my imaginary friends interrupt me. Why would they do that? Um, no. I, I love you and I am your boss. Um, uh, so is there just a one mic? Okay, so I'm just, I don't have to point all over the room. Fire away. That was her question. Okay. No, 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 I'm kidding. The Blu-ray for the original Buffy movie was just announced. Were we going to be getting an extremely snarky writer commentary? Snappy, snarky, it's a fine line. Um, uh, no, actually, I didn't even know about it. They, they didn't call me. They, they had a DVD party and I wasn't invited. Yes, feel sorry for the man who has everybody cheering for him. Yes, that's it. If I, I can get your approbation and your sympathy, what a day. Hello. Um, okay. If Buffy and Angel had continued on TV through season eight and after the fall, would they have done? Would you have done them the exact same way as in the comics? Uh, there's no way you could have done on TV, certainly for the money uh, that we were being given uh, to make the show, um, what we did, and also um, you couldn't have had an entire episode of them having sex. Well, maybe. No, that could never happen except in season six. But. Um, <laughs> The point, kind of the point of season eight for me was, hey, we, it's a comic and we can do these things that we could not have done on television. And I think that ultimately became sort of um, a little bit of an albatross for us. And uh, the kind you've already killed, not the cute kind that's like River. And um, uh, because, uh, because people were more interested in, in her life than they were in, in the fact that we could draw bigger things. So, um, you know, that's why I'm excited about season nine again, because... Um, for having discovered that I can do it differently than the television show, I've discovered that I don't really want to. Mr. Reed, I love you so much and everything you do. Um, I wanted to ask you, Astonishing X-Men was what originally got me into comics. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And I was wondering if you are ever planning on doing that again or any other big name comic title? I don't think any of my work upcoming has anything to do with big comic titles. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, um, I, uh, I have actually no plans at this time to uh, wrestle with a big title. Uh, I would like to, um, but um, I have a feeling after making this movie, uh, uh, maybe not so much, uh, just from sheer exhaustion. Um, the X-Men of all the titles uh, of all the books I could have written for was, was really the, the grail. Um, there are definitely things that I would love to do, and Brian Hitch and I always go, we should do some Spider-Man. And um, I'm like, that's great. What's, what can we do that hasn't been done? Let's not do Spider-Man. <laughs> um, um, although I am going to do a Spider-Man reboot movie uh, in a year. It's going to be Justin Bieber and Elle Fanning, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's going to be really, really bad. Uh. Uh, hi, Joss. I'm a big fan of that uh, beautiful brain. And, uh, <laughs> the beautiful and very visible brain. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether you wrote Buffy with uh, like a big end in mind, sort of the end, the end of her life, or you just worked on a season-to-season -season basis as you told the story of her life. Well, every season was designed for us to be canceled. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, something I didn't prepare for was Firefly. Weird. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but you know, it, it is an uncertain life. And so every season we wanted to go out with just enough so that we could say, if we never come back, we have a sense of closure. Um, that's why we never did cliffhangers 
um, because we, uh, you know, we always we were we were never sure. Um, in fact, the first time I did a cliffhanger was um, season four of Angel, um, and uh, I was like, oh. I'm sorry, it was season, season three was the first time. And, it was, and then I came back and was like, oh, the first episode is so much easier to write now. Because <laughs> um, our first episodes were almost always our weakest. Um, uh, because, you know, we, we sort of closed everything out. So we didn't, it didn't have to be big. Like the last episode of season four um, with the dream was really just a coda and not a giant climax. But it, uh, but it always had to be enough. Um, what did you see in Lila and Wes that made you realize how amazing and perfect they were for each other? And do you ever intend for them to fall in love, or do you think it just kind of happened? I heard everything in that question except the people's names. Lila and Wes. Oh, Lila and Wes. Well, let's see. They hate each other. They agree on nothing. They're diametrically opposed, and they're both super sexy. I don't know what made me think we should get them together. <laughs> um, yeah, that uh, they really, they, 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 they had quite the chemistry. Um, you know, when you get people who can't stand each other um, in bed together, uh, fun ensues. That's all I'm saying. Hi, um, now that you own the rights for the um, Angel now, with the Angel and Faith comics, will we see characters like Illyria or Connor show up? Yes. Um, all of the Buffy and Angelverse characters are under one roof now. And this is a really good thing. Um, you know, and I do want to thank the guys at IDW for shepherding Angel for so long and doing a wonderful job with it. But at the end of the day, it makes life easier and better to have them all in each other's worlds. And, and the best part will be taking people from Angel's world and putting them in Buffy's in a way that we never have before and vice versa. The books will start out uh, separately. They do all sort of, the go is the end of season eight. But of Buffy, but um, we're going to keep them in their own worlds a little bit, just so the books can establish their own identities, and it doesn't just become this giant, you have to buy everything crossover fest, which I feel is unfair. Um, but then, uh, very soon after that, we're going to get really silly. And, and uh, you know, if, if I had the time, there would be about five other people who'd have their own bo standalone books. Um, but as it is, we're going to be trying to... We're, work out some mini-series and one-shots and making sure that everybody gets in everybody else's soup because there's so many great dynamics there. And I just need more Illyria. Hi, Joss. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Frey popping up in season eight. Um, was it difficult to bring the two worlds together? Um, that was actually some of the easiest and most fun stuff. That, uh, that I got to do. Those two worlds uh, being so separate but so connected uh, made writing that just pretty much pure joy. And having Carl back to do it um, because it was Frey was really, was really lovely. Uh, it was, you know, obviously there's some reconciling issues. Basically all of the Buffy comic has been, you know, uh, affected by Frey, which I wrote thinking, there's no way this will ever affect Buffy, because it's 200 years in the future, so I'm totally safe. Um, so, uh, but now that, it, now that I've resolved the fact that, yes, they are connected universes, bringing them together uh, was, you know, just a delight. Mostly because I got to have Frey say, Summer, you drive like a spaz, which... Uh, Sorry? Hi. Uh, in the Buffalo... In <laughs> In the Buffy and Angel universe. Did you say uh, Buffalo? I was... <laughs> you said Buffalo, didn't you? I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering if there were any characters who you either regret killing off or introducing. <laughs> yes, I, re I regret introducing Tara. Um, no. Um, no. Uh, you know... Uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of regret. The fact of the matter is, 
Um, we all know that sometimes I have killed beloved characters because I believe that that is something that people in those kinds of stories need to go through. But, and we all know that there are some characters I introduced that did not stick to the wall quite as successfully as others. Um, but I don't live with a lot of regret. Every character that we had, we got to milk for some really interesting stories. And when, if people didn't like them, we either found a way to make them like them or played that up as part of their persona. Uh, we, you know, we got to ride the surf of people's, you know, involved, the fans' involvement. Um, and I really I just, I'm not big with regret. Uh, I just, it's not on my schedule. Hi, I was just wondering if we're going to see a more consistent, like, scenes of Spike in season nine, and if we'd find out where he got his bug ship. Um, yes, eventually we will discover where he got his insect dirigible. And, um, and he's going to be, you know, a real factor in Buffy's life. Uh, you know, you just, you, you got to put those two in a room. It's just too much fun. Um, I can't say which room, but. Oh, Joss, big fan. I really love the Firefly verse, and I was wondering if, you know, we saw the shepherd's tail and float out. Are we going to have any more backgrounds from any other characters like Mal or Nora? You know, um, uh, I want to. I don't have anything on the drawing board right now because, um, because of busyness and craziness and laziness and dizziness. But, um, uh, but yeah, we, we'd like to do some more backstory stuff. And I think at this point, you know, we have license uh, at some point as well to move forward with these characters too. Um, I think it's safe to say. But, uh, you know, it would be interesting to know what happens next. Right. The Wash Clone Wars are going to be among my most popular works. Um, I know you're a big X-Men fan, and that Kitty Pride was kind of an inspiration. Yeah, Emma Frost. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> are you about to slam her? Because, uh, no, um, and that Kitty Pride was an inspiration for Buffy, and I wanted to know if you consciously drew from Rogue when you developed Echo on Dollhouse. Um, you know, they're connected. Uh, there was not... Uh, Echo was an attempt at something very different. Somebody with, you know no support system or identity of any kind. Um, and that really didn't come from the same place as, as Kitty and Buffy, except in the sense that I always write about helplessness and the gaining of strength and the building of identity. Um, Echo was a more pure version of that. Buffy reflected Kitty in the way that they were both young and suddenly burdened with responsibility, but they both had the context of their lives. The whole point about Echo is that she had had that taken away from her. I don't actually know a lot of people like that. It was more of a, of a stretch. It was almost kind of my robot fiction. I like your outfit, too. Hi. Um, so throughout Angel, there's uh, references to the powers that be and it doesn't happen in uh, Buffy. And I was wondering if that was an idea that you didn't have when you were first writing Buffy, or, uh, yeah, that's it. You know, everybody had some kind of, you know, controlling force out there that uh, was supposed to be benign, but didn't quite seem to get it done. Um, on Angel, we defined them differently. Uh, but, you know, Buffy, there was always, not just the Watcher's Council, but the first, you know, uh, people who had made the first Slayers and sort of, there, there was always some new weird council of old men or women or beings or clouds or something that was out there that you would basically need as something to invoke or something to move the story along or something to rail against um, for not making things better. Um, something that would seem to be in opposition to the very dark forces that were, you know, obviously personified in Wolfram and Hart, but uh, at the end of the day, really proved more than the evil ever did that everything is just shades of gray and that no matter who's out there, we, are, we do have to do this ourselves. Uh, would you ever bring Buffy to Broadway? <laughs> you 
You mean like take her to a show? <laughs> um, I would. I can't say that I will, or that by the time I try to, anyone will want me to, but yeah, I think she belongs there. In the theater opposite where Dr. Horrible is. So, as everyone can attest, you're a master of breaking our hearts by killing off fan favorites, you know, Tara, Anya, Giles, uh, Joyce, but on a scale of 1 to 10 for Buffy Season 9, how badly are you planning on smashing our hearts into the ground and pulverizing them? Look, you all know I want you to suffer, okay? It's, it's like a drug. I can't help it. Um, uh, season 9 is not designed around tragedy, but then life seldom is, it just happens. Um, uh, do I plan to do something awful and break your hearts? I'm not going to tell you, but, uh, but season 9 has some, some very edgy stuff in it, some very new stuff in it, but it is not built around darkness per se, um, except in the fact that, you know, Buffy is always and always trying to find out who she is, which can be complicated and sometimes dangerous and sticky and weird. Um, but um, whether or not I'm going to do something appalling in season nine, I will not reveal, because um, that would take out the fun of your suffering. I wasn't going to, but now I am, because of him. Hi, um, I just wanted to say my sister and I love your show, it's, yeah. Um, so I was curious, what is your reaction to the queer community's absolute love of your show? Because I know there's a big following in the queer community for your show. Um, well, I'm against it. Um, that's, you know, guys, you're making the Lord angry. Um, it is. Um, When, when I, you didn't think I was going to bring up an Alien Resurrection, but I am. Um, that Alien Resurrection, uh, its sole virtue for me was when I was writing it, um, discovering, you know, the idea of Clone Ripley and uh, Robo Winona, um, kind of coming to terms with the idea of being considered less than human, despite the fact that they were both, you know, powerful and beautiful. Um, thinking and internalizing that and feeling um, like, a, like an underclass of human being. And um, to me, I was like, this is a very powerful metaphor, um, in particular for the gay community and, um, and for teenagers who are, who are struggling with that. And ultimately, it's a metaphor for everybody who feels like an outsider, but that was my first thought, um, that that was what made it, interesting and Buffy was basically sort of an extension of that, that kind of storytelling. Um, I didn't like actively go out with an agenda, but it absolutely means everything to me that uh, the gay communities have embraced the shows because they are for them as much or more than anyone else. Obviously, huge fan of your writing and uh, of Firefly. Um, <laughs> amazing, amazing. And uh, I know we're all shaped by, our, by the stories of our youth, but do you have anything from your life experience as a child that, that has really contributed to the richness in your writing? Um, I, I actually managed to get through my childhood without having a life experience. Um, I stayed in my room and my life experience was reading Frank Herbert. Does that count? Is that similar to a life experience? Um, I, uh, um, I was afraid of most things. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I didn't have a terrible childhood or anything, but, uh, but I didn't, I don't, I don't really feel that I had a remarkable one either. I, you know, the things that you see, fear, helplessness, pain, loss, um, 
you know, uh, these things uh, are things I was struggling with, the sense of aloneness. Um, these are, you know, very common issues with me, but um, they weren't based on spectacular events that I can recount to you in a David copperfield -y way. Um, I can just say um, that, yeah, you know, uh, I was a little bit pathetic. <laughs> just a little bit. I've, you know, not anymore, though. <laughs> Oh. oh, I'm I'm totally cool I'm, with my beautiful hair and um, so sorry it's kind of a lame answer but there it is I really was kind of a shut in. Hey Joss, uh, given the work that DC has been doing with their animated films and that a number of your actors have been doing uh, or voice parts for them, is there a Buffy season eight animated feature in our future? Um, how much money do you have on you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I ain't a guinea. Uh, we spent a lot of time and, and noble effort trying to put a Buffy animated show on the air and uh, with zero success. Um, it still baffles me to this day. Um, I'm also waiting for somebody to call me and tell me it's time to make that Serenity sequel, but... Um, But they won't. <laughs> Sorry, I just that much love I had to destroy it. Um, but um, so you know, I, I think it's it lends itself to it. It's right. It's like when people say, "Should you make a Firefly musical?" I'm like, "No, that is a bad idea. That is like cops who rock." Um, but um, but something like animated Buffy as a feature as a, you know, as a straight-to-DVD, as a, as a series, it, it, it makes perfect sense. Like a Buffy musical, they just make sense. Should I, I say Serenity sequel again and make you all excited? Yeah. Hi, Joss, thanks for coming out here. So I was in a literature class the other day, and we, we were asked to think of male feminist authors, and you were the first one that came to mind. Um, <laughs> So my question is, why do you consistently include strong female characters in your writing? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, um, was it why do I write them? Yes. Ah. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there is a video on YouTube that can help you with this question. Um, uh, uh, go, uh, look, uh, look up Equality Now with my name, and, uh, and you should look up Equality Now anyway. Um, but um, but at the end of the day, I have many answers for it. They have to do with my mom, who's an extraordinary woman and a great feminist. They have to do with the people in my life. They have to do with a lot of different things, but I don't know because I'm not just writing strong female characters for other people. I have a desire to see them in our culture um, that was not met for most of my childhood, um, except occasionally by James Cameron. Um, but uh, Cameron and Miyazaki, those were the guys who were getting it done way before me. But, um, I don't know why I think I'm a 14-year-old girl with superpowers. <laughs> I don't look like one. But I can't get past it. In fact, the only trouble I've had with the Avengers is, is I'm like, where, where is the 14-year-old girl with superpowers? I'm very confused. Is it you, Robert Downey Jr.? Is you the one? No, it's not me. It's not me. Probably Clark Gregg. Hey there, Joss. Thanks for coming. Uh, considering you mentioned to J.J. Abrams last year how much you enjoyed the new Star Trek reboot, I was wondering if you would ever consider lending your amazing voice to those iconic characters in the comics, maybe for IDW or what have you. I don't think so. I'm actually going to say no to this one because um, I think Star Trek 
What makes Star Trek great um, is, is a little ephemeral and not something that I would be chasing because they are their own voices. And for me, the comics, um, it's harder for them to capture. And I've not read, there may be wonderful Star Trek comics and I'm not dissing on them, but for me, that's not something I'm attracted to because I'm interested in the way they're going to create the universe visually in a film or a TV show. Um, you know, I'll see every new incarnation of it, and I did love JJ's. But for the comics, um, if I was going to, you know, spend my time, extremely difficult. I would not want to wade into something with that much history and that much difference. I, I don't feel the payoff would be great. I'd rather work on something new or something that I've already done, in, but in comic book form, because I seem to do that all the time. Hi. Um... Can we expect to see a Dr. Horrible 2 anytime soon? The thing that you have to understand is yes. I'll just say this, um, I've worked on a number of songs. I got a, a demo from Jed Marissa uh, of a song uh, that actually Zach pitched that they wrote, and as soon as I heard it, just like when we did the first one, I just said I would respectfully like to withdraw my songs, I'm sorry, <laughs> because it's so good. Hi, Jess. Um, ben Edlund. Will he be writing any of the new comics for season nine? Um, I have not approached Ben about this, but uh, if I can get Ben in any of my houses at any point, I want Ben in my house. What a talent. And an amazing singer. What? Yeah. No, actually, Ben is the guy that, uh, there's no other way to put this, we hate. Um, because while he's pitching great ideas for Angel, he's drawing really amazing drawings that he's just leaving out on the table and then going into his office and playing guitar beautifully and singing. And we're like, come on! <laughs> Leave us something! <laughs> that guy's crazy. He is actually crazy, but in a talent way. Okay, Joss, um, my question is, on both Angel and Buffy, it seems that the seventh episode seems to, to be the most significant that will foreshadow the rest of the season. Was that deliberate? I'm sorry, could you ask that again, please? Okay, um, in both Buffy and Angel, the seventh episode of each season seems to be the most deliberate, like, that will foreshadow the rest of the season. For example, Light on Me, uh, you know, Conversations with Dead People, Once More with Feeling, uh, so, was that a deliberate thing, or just a coincidence? Um, it was based on the fact, usually, that the seventh episode would be the second one that I could direct. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I would save all the goodies for myself, as often as I could. Um, this is, it's, it's, it's not kind of me, but I could, but there it is. Um, oh, there's more. Okay, I thought we were done. It's like, oh, that's it. I've given you all the knowledge I have. Go forth and... Uh, Hi, Joss. I'm not aware of that film. Yeah. Sorry. First of all, I'm a huge fan. But, and I actually didn't have a question to ask you until you mentioned that you would love to write five standalone uh, characters in their own comic arcs. And I was curious who they would be and what you would write if you had the time. Well, if I knew what I would write, I would have written it. <laughs> um, I am not positive. Um, obviously, Willow has a journey to go through that uh, is very much her own. Um, as I mentioned, Illyria is, is, is near and dear to my heart. And, um, I, you know, the Kennedy Riley book is going to be, I think, probably the most popular of our <laughs> series. And that's... Um, I, I, you know, 
there, there are a lot. It's hard. I, I'm sort of deeply in love with, with all of these characters, and, and uh, I could give them all solos. I, there are a few that I'd like to see really highlighted. Some of them are dead, um, but well, how often has that stopped me? Hi, Joss. Um, I was wondering, in the future of the Buffyverse, will there be stories that make Dawn a stronger character? That make Dawn a stronger character? Well, um, I'm not going to turn her into a superhero. Um, she is going to be going on her own life's journey and having her own identity and not just being a little sister anymore, um, which is going to become increasingly problematic for Buffy. Um, but uh, um, I don't think of Dawn as a particularly weak character. I think we all know that she might have complained once or twice on the show. Um, I always felt that she had more reason to complain than almost any teenager I knew, but wanted to get, play more variations with her character uh, than I got to. I don't think of her as weak, though. I think she's very much, uh, in a way, Buffy's greatest support system right now. Um, and you'll be seeing that uh, to an extent in season nine, but also she's somebody who's just moving on with her life, um, which is um, problematic for Buffy um, because it's not so easy for her. So I don't know if you'll consider her to be strong or not. It's not an agenda in the way that it was like with Cordelia, uh, where we wanted to do the same thing we did with Wesley, take somebody that you thought of as bumbling or superficial and build them up into somebody extraordinary. Um, Dawn is, for me, a touchstone of the non-extraordinary. That's why she and Xander are together, because they feel more like me. Dull. <laughs> and whiny. No. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, you're my hero, and I hope that I can be like you when I grow up. Um, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you've gotten to explore these universes and tell stories in different mediums, what's the difference like, um, in crafting these stories in comics versus television? The difference is not great. It's just really about rhythm. It's about how much you can give because the comics come out obviously just uh, once a month and um, you know, if you're telling a story over more than one issue then it, it breaks down into acts but having four months to complete one act instead of one hour is very different. Um, and that's pretty much it. In terms of how they're structured, in terms of uh, how much you need to put in a script, in terms of being sure of your collaborators and knowing they're going to give you, you know, the footage, because your, you know, your artist is your co-director, um, and uh, you know, he's and uh, he's also your costumer, which thank God for George's Janty, because he is one of the best costumers in comics. Something he doesn't get nearly enough cred for. Yes, we all know he's a wonderful dancer, but he is, um, you know, he also brings an enormous amount of life to it. You're always going to have that sort of give and take in the relationship, and you're always going to be trying to structure around emotion and around your, your act breaks, uh, which could be page breaks, they could be commercial breaks, they could be the end of an issue. You're always going to look for that little pop to keep people going. Um, um, but... Uh, you do have to sort of parcel things out differently. Apart from that, it really is very similar. Oh, also, um, your actors don't ever change their lines. Um, but if you don't proofread uh, the comics occasionally, <laughs> they do. <laughs> so, gotta, gotta proofread, because I'm a terrible typist. Are you going to make a Dr. Horrible comic book? Uh, we have made some, we will make more. The beating heart of the Dr. Horrible comic book universe is scribe Zach Whedon, who has penned just all of them and done such a great job. Um, and, and it's delightful because he just does it and then I just get to read it. I mean, I'm in charge and it's totally my vision and I'm super important and I should have my own panel. But uh, Zach, has, Zach has really carried that banner, and it's been, um, it's been such a delight for all of us. Hello. Um, with the Avengers, you're working with characters who are already iconic characters, and you're working with actors who have already been set up by three other directors. 
How much more challenging is that versus your own world that you've already created? Um, you know, it's not that different. Um, you, you come to it, you know, you come to a relationship with an actor um, that you build, you know, on the set and in pre-production. You, you take what parameters you have. In something like the Avengers, there's an enormous number of parameters. There are visual styles that have been worked out by different directors. There are the people who play the characters of the people who haven't. Um, there's, you know, all the reconciling of what's going on in the comic books and the movies and what can you take from and what can you use and what could you need to avoid and how do you make them all work together. Um, there, there are so many concerns, but at the end of the day, you know, as soon as there's been an episode of a TV show, you're already in that world of, well, how do I resolve with what I already have? As soon as you, you know, there are always going to be parameters based on who is my audience, uh, what can I get away with, um, how long do I have to tell this story. There's going to be, you know, how many fights, uh, musical numbers, bloody killings, whatever, the, whatever kind of thing it is you're making. You have these things stuck in when you're making genre that you must adhere to and you must respect. With the Avengers, it hasn't actually been as hard as I thought it would be. Um, what I find is that these characters mesh through their differences really well. And I, what I also find is that these actors um, are having a great time playing against each other. And um, they are, as a troop, um, actually a much better team than the Avengers are. <laughs> Hi, Joss. Um, at one point I read that you were pursuing a miniseries called Ripper, and I was wondering if we'd be able to read more about Giles' origin story in the comics. Um, uh, I have said this to some people, that uh, they are going to get a, a whiff of Ripper in, um, in the Angel and Faith book. This is the case. Um, uh, they are living at uh, Giles' house, and uh, they're going to be immersed in his world a little bit. Um, I would still and always want to do um, an actual Ripper series or movie. I have broached it and been close to it so many times that I think if I ever mention it to Anthony Stort Head again, he will put a knife in my throat. <laughs> he is a lovely, gentle man. I think he will take up a big knife and deservedly kill me. So unless we're actually rolling, <laughs> Um, it will, when we actually have the cameras rolling, I will call him, say, come from your house, uh, we're rolling. <laughs> oh, it's Ripper. No, really. Uh, until then, I, I gotta play it cool, because he's at this con, and he could have a knife. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, Doss. Um, I was just wondering, since good writers are always changing and evolving, if there's anything you've written for publication that you thought was awesome and then looked back on years later and wondered, did I really write that? No, everything I've written is awesome. Um, <laughs> and, uh, in a way, it's a burden. But, uh, you know, it's actually, I... I uh, um, I recently pulled out a script, a film that I'd written about 20 years ago, um, one of the first of many to not sell. And, um, uh, and it was fun, it was interesting. I liked it a lot, but I was like, this guy's young. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, he showed promise, A for effort. Um, there's, you know, I, I, I don't think there's, you know, and anything I've done that I'm really like, oh my God, and yes, I am including the Frankenstein episode of, in season two of Buffy. Um, but uh, because there was always a good intent, um, and at least something in there that made me smile and that was worthy. Um, I've definitely, uh, I have recently actually also read some uh, letters I wrote to my mother from boarding school. Those are a little florid. A little self-indulgent. <laughs> Definitely 16. Hi. 
Um, I wanted to ask you if you intentionally tried to put a lot of the character of Kitty Pride in Kaylee, or if that just kind of happened after loving the character of Kitty Pride so much. Put the, kitty, the character of Kitty Pride in whom? Kaylee from Firefly. I never even saw the connection. But then I often don't. Um, I am often unaware of my, let us call it, theft. Um, uh, no, you know, I, I uh, but I, now that you say it, <laughs> oh yeah, okay, so. <laughs> another original idea from Josh Sweden. <laughs> Could you have asked me that when we were alone? Um, no, it was not deliberate, um, but I do see the connection now. Thanks. <laughs> Look, my pony did its trick again. <laughs> Yay for my pony. Hey, Joss. First, you're awesome. Second, uh, would you... I know you've done a lot of strong female characters, some who are lesbian, especially in the Buffyverse. Would you consider doing a strong gay male character that's, you know, out and proud or, or just, you know, visible? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. I have actually wanted to do a book. Um, I had a particular one in mind. Uh, it is not uh, on the front burner, but uh, I do think it's about time. I think I've... At some point, you write enough lesbians, people realize, this is just a guy. <laughs> this isn't feminism, this is Cinemax. <laughs> so... I do think uh, it's time for a little equal opportunity. Besides, who doesn't love cock? Okay. Okay, and um, then I remember the children. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, okay, um, this is actually kind of similar. Um, I was at the Joe Chan panel, and she was talking about a, a story that she pitched to you about um, Angel and Spike um, kind of hooking up a bit. And I was wondering um, what your initial thoughts about, about it were. Um, you know, uh, I got to do what was supposed to be a two-page story, but that's very, that's like the six word story, I can't do that. Um, so we expanded it to, I think, three. Um, and with Joe, and I had never done, you know, she'd have done the covers, and she's a miracle worker, and I adore her. Um, but uh, that was the first time I got to do narrative with her, but because it was a, a short piece, and I, this, is, again, is something I'll do with artists and with actors, if it's where, a world where I'm already very comfortable and sort of know my way around, I asked her, what do you want? And she said, um, I'd like to have um, Caleb in it and some yaoi. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Caleb and yaoi, coming up. And uh, I loved that, book, that little three pages of naughtiness. It was a delight. Hi, Joss. I'm a big fan of the Dollhouse series, um, particularly Adele and Topher, <laughs> favorite characters. I was wondering if we're going to see any more Dollhouse comics coming. Uh, yes, we are. Um, they've got some on deck already, and we'll see by their reception whether we can uh, we keep going with that. Um, again, it's a question of time and manpower, because we all, you know, I feel, I have very strong feelings about that verse. It's been hard for me because there were so many things about the show that felt a little compromised, and then I sort of went, well, like, you know, I guess we didn't hit the mark because there were things that I wanted to talk about that Fox wasn't comfortable with. And then, so it's taken me a while to realize, first of all, that it has fans, um, and that I am one of them. <laughs> that it, uh, that show, it meant a great deal to me, and I don't know that I always articulated it as successfully as I would had in other shows, but um, when we did, um, it was as powerful as anything we've done. I, the scene between uh, Amy Acker and Fran Kranz, and the first episode of season two is, is about as happy as I ever need to be. <laughs> Deafening silence. Or are we actually supposed to be done? Is that what's going on? Yes, they're telling me to wrap it up. So, 
Just one more song, and then... No song. No song. I'm, I am going to give you a gift that I don't give many people. I am going to not sing. So, yes. I, I knew Dance of Joy was coming right after that. You know, I was like... You know, I have great joy. I will express it by saying thank you. Thank you guys so much, as always, for coming out. It means everything. You guys are great. Thank <laughs> you.